Remember when Nike had a mascot named Swoosh? Let's go back. Tamagotchi, the of Y2K. The year is 1996. The Nintendo 64 and Tickle Me Elmo are released. People everywhere are doing the Macarena. Caller ID triples in the United States after Scream hits theaters. And Michael Jordan and the Bulls win the NBA Finals. Tom Cruise has a big year with both Mission Impossible and Jerry Maguire being released. But the biggest film of the year is Independence Day, a film about aliens coming to Earth. A film accidentally loosely based on Tom Cruise's beliefs and Nike introduces a new mascot named Swoosh. This is Swoosh. Look at him. Take it all in. He looks like a fetish-friendly Robocop. Nike created the superhero mascot in an attempt to attract children to their brand. The ones who aren't making their shoes, that is. The thing is, Nike already had Michael Jordan. This is the 90s, and Michael Jordan basically was a superhero to so many kids around the world at the time. I mean, I once saw Jordan win a game against an all-star team with the help from only two rabbits, a duck, and a sexual predator. Every kid in the world wanted a pair of Air Jordans, so why create swoosh? Well, I don't really have an answer for that, except for the fact that sometimes executives have bad ideas. Actually, scratch that. Not sometimes. Most of the time. I mean, this is the same company that thought the Oregon Ducks mascot Donald needed a cooler sidekick named Mandrake. Cheer! And a crack there, amidst the smoke of what looked like a dinosaur egg, Donald's twin, obviously not identical by the way, was born. Fans dubbed him Duck Vader and absolutely hated him. Looks familiar, huh? This was in 2002, they just didn't learn their lesson. On a side note, how did Oregon get away with their mascot being a duck named Donald who's also dressed as a sailor? Anyway, back to the human condom known as Swoosh. To fully understand how Swoosh came to be, we need to start at the very beginning of his inception. This is John Kudo. John always dreamed of being a mascot, and at only 20 years old he realized that dream by becoming Crunch, the fan favorite mascot of NBA's Minnesota Timberwolves. In 1996, he receives a top-secret invite to Nike headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon. The invitation's for a tryout, but it doesn't explain what the tryout is for. John decides to go regardless because, well, it's Nike. And he arrives at the Bo Jackson Fitness Center. He's hired on the spot, after wowing Nike executives with his basketball tricks, flips, and overall showmanship. Like something out of the movies, John is put on a plane immediately and brought to Los Angeles. Keep in mind, he still isn't aware of what job he's been hired to do. When he arrives in Los Angeles, he learns about Nike's marketing team's new idea. The idea is to host sports-themed shows featuring the likes of Michael Jordan, Charles Barkley, Tiger Woods, and Carl Lewis. And at these shows, they will introduce the new face of Nike, Swoosh. The first thing Nike does when John arrives is introduce him to Bob Ringwood. Ringwood is a costume designer and the costume design for Swoosh will make more sense when you realize he also designed Val Kilmer's Batman suit for Tim Burton's 1989 Batman. John is handed a huge jar of Vaseline. Hey, I thought that's what you're supposed to do to get the job. I'll get the lubricant. There's no time for lubricant! There's always time for lubricant! I he covers himself in Vaseline in an attempt to squeeze into a body mold. John lays there for hours waiting for it to dry, and thus, Swoosh is born. You're probably wondering how much this suit costs. What if I told you it cost $50,000? You're probably thinking, damn, that's insane. Did they make it out of gold? And to that, I would tell you, I lied. It actually cost $125,000. When adjusted for inflation, that's nearly $225,000 today. Nike bought two of them. Look, I found something similar on Amazon for just over $100. I should be in charge of Nike's finances from here on out. Believe it or not, this isn't the first time Nike tried to create their own superhero. Back in the 80s, they had Reflecto Man, who bared an uncanny resemblance to Captain America, complete with his own shield. Despite all these signs, in September 1996, Swoosh made his debut at the Hoop Hero Show in Tokyo. This was a show featuring both Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley. However, there would be no basketball game played. 
Because of their contracts with the NBA, they were restricted to simply running basketball drills. Jordan and Barkley's contracts weren't the only issue with the show. This was the first time John would be donning the swoosh costume. The suit was tight, restricting his ability to move. The suit was also really hot inside, not ideal for someone who was doing a lot of physical activity in it. Then there were the Nike sunglasses. John could not see out of them, eventually popping them off just so he could perform. However, Swoosh was a huge hit at this particular show. Zipping from one end of the building to the other on a zip line, the crowd went insane over Swoosh. John described the experience as feeling like a rock star. He flew over the crowd without a harness or safety net. Hey, this is the 90s, workplace injuries weren't invented yet. John was feeling on top of the world. Nike continued to host shows around the world. There was a track and field expo in Australia, a soccer game in Munich, and a golf show in Japan with Tiger Woods, all featuring Swoosh. When Nike returned to the United States, they hosted a soccer game between Brazil and Colombia at the Orange Bowl. The American audience did not have the same reaction as the international audience. They weren't quite won over with Swoosh's charm and tricks, and this is where things began to go downhill. The shows Nike were hosting and the money sunk into Swoosh were showing a loss. Then, in 1997, shoe sales dropped and caused the company to make cuts. One of the people to get the boot was John Kudo and his alter ego Swoosh. And thus ends the tale of Nike's second, but not last attempt at creating a superhero mascot. John would be fine though. Three years after the Swoosh failure, he became Spot the Fire Dog for the WNBA's Portland Fire. Then, in 2003, he made his triumphant return to the NBA as the Cleveland Cavaliers mascot Moondog for the next 15 years. So what did we learn here? I think we learned to never make our fetishes public, like one of Nike's executives did. Swoosh in the end may have been a marketing failure, but I'm sure to some he's a fond memory from their childhood. After seeing some of the only remaining footage of Swoosh's performances, some of the stuff he did was pretty incredible. I couldn't find a video of it, but at one point he jumped headfirst through a glass wall. Despite not seeing it, I'm sure it looked a lot cooler than when this guy did it. And with that, what better way to sign off this video than with Nike's famous slogan? Just do it! Unless doing it consists of creating a BDSM Power Ranger, then don't do it. Bye everyone.